you, Kirk, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to preach this morning. Uh, it's good to be with you all, even if it's like this again. Uh, like, I agree with you, it's, it is a strange way to do church, but uh, we trust that the Lord has uh, what He wants to do in mind, and we look forward to the day when, when uh, we can all gather again safely. Uh, would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word and what you want to say to us through your word. And we thank you for the, the stories that are in there, like Josh was saying. And we thank you for the big story of redemption that you bring to us. We thank you for uh, the book of Acts that we've been working through and all that is in there and all that it teaches us, especially the speeches, especially the prayers, especially the things uh, not just that that happened, but things that you really want us to learn. You want us to imitate. You want us to imitate and follow you. So we pray that you would help us do that today. As we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going through the book of Acts. We find ourselves coming to the end of the book of Acts. Uh, Kirk was kind enough to give me three chapters to cover this morning. What a guy, yes. And so uh, what I'd like to do really is, is um, really focus on chapter 26. And it's a, what happens in 24 through 26 is kind of a coming to the end of Paul's trials uh, before um, the Roman authorities uh, still in Judea and in that area before he is shipped off to Rome. But I'd like to start with a story. There was a, there was a drunk man named Joe, and uh, he was quite the wino. He was, uh, he was really a pretty hopeless guy, and uh, he, he was out on the streets, uh, always, always drunk, and he made it to this mission and actually gave his life to Jesus Christ and became kind of a fixture at this mission. And in fact, he had this great humble attitude and a humble heart, and he would do pretty much anything that was asked of him to do. He would clean the toilets and the bathrooms after the men had come in and been there. That After the services, he would uh, pick up things and uh, he would talk with men. Uh, when men would come in off the streets, he would even take them in and help them even when they were drunk, and help them put, to, put them to bed and, and pray with them and pray for them. Christ really did change his life, Joe's life. So one evening, there was, uh, after the service at the mission, there was a man at the front of the, of the church service of the, ser- uh, of the mission, and he was kneeling at the steps and praying this prayer, he'd say, Lord, make me like Joe. Lord, please make me like Joe. I, I want to be like Joe. Please make me like Joe. And finally, the director of the mission came to the man and he said, he said, son, wouldn't it be better if you said, Lord, make me like Jesus? And the guy kind of had a inquisitive look on his face. He looked up at him and he said, is he like Joe? So the question is, for you and me, do people see Jesus in you? When they look at your life, do they see Jesus? And is your life one that is actually worth imitating? Because even though Paul's ultimate task was to proclaim the gospel of grace, as Kirk has been talking about over the last several weeks. He had an inspired calling also that we find in this chapter today, that he was called to preach that gospel to small and great alike, and that his deepest desire would be that all may become what I am. He says, except for these chains, I want everybody to become what I am. So in this chapter and what we're going to discover today in 
in Paul's trials and his journeys is a pretty good life lesson on how to keep the main thing the main thing. In other words, it's easy for us to get distracted. Paul did not let himself get distracted. And he had this attitude in him when he even writes this in Philippians. He's, he's exhibiting this attitude in himself that was also in Christ Jesus. It's interesting, Paul not only reflected the attitude and actions of Jesus, his life actually paralleled the life of Jesus in terms of uh, his ministry in Acts 9 through 20. And then when he got arrested and he actually went to Jerusalem, knowing he needed to go to Jerusalem, just like Jesus did. And then he had a trial before the Sanhedrin. And then a trial before Felix and Festus and, and King Agrippa that we're going to look at today. These are all the same things that Jesus went through. Paul actually went one step further and got to go to Rome, which God had called him to do. So here's what we see in Acts 26 in verses 19 through 19. <laughs> That's a very short scripture today. <laughs> it actually should say 19 through 29. So then, this is Paul talking, and he's just shared about this vision that he had of Jesus Christ, where he's sharing his testimony. He got knocked off his horse, and he got led to uh, Damascus, and he was, uh, you know, he had these scales on his eye. He had a vision of what Jesus wanted him to do. He said, King Agrippa, I was not a disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. Notice that, even, that verse right there even, even parallels what Jesus told his disciples to do. He said, go to, to Jer Jerusalem, and then to Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, to the Gentiles. And he says, I did that. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and they tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. In other words, God had rescued him every single time to this very day. So I stand here to testify to small and great alike, a phrase that I love in this passage and we're going to look at a little bit later. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the, the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. Here's a man, here's a, a, a Roman official a governor calling Paul insane to his face. And look at Paul's response. He says, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. He has been uh, insulted in the worst way, called insane. And what is his response? He calls him most excellent Festus. Interesting. Have this attitude in you, which was also in Jesus Christ. He says, what I'm saying is true and reasonable. Do you believe that your faith is true and reasonable? I do. I believe that Christianity is a true and reasonable faith. And we've lost this past week one of our greatest Christian apologists, to my knowledge, Ravi Zacharias. He is now with the Lord, but if you look up Ravi Zacharias, anything about him, you will understand, you will hear him explain the gospel and and. and and what God's grace is, and who God is in, in um, ways that will help you understand that our faith is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, Paul says, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. Another great phrase, it wasn't done in a corner. Now, was Jesus born in a corner? Yeah, I think so. I mean, he was kind of out of the way, and only shepherds knew about it. And, but this, his life, his death, his trials, his resurrection, everything wasn't done in a corner. It was talked about all, all over the place. 
uh, f- several weeks ago, we talked about the, uh, the two disciples, you know, and Jesus, sh- they're walking to Emmaus, and Jesus shows up with them. And they say, are you the only one who n- doesn't know what's going? It's like the guy who was out, uh, you know, sailing from January until April, and he came back, and the coronavirus hit, and it changed the whole world. It's like saying, have you been living under a rock? I mean, these things were not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Emphasis here on the short time. Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. I pray that everyone would become what I am except for these chains. He keeps the main thing the main thing. How about you? Do you get easily distracted? I do. I think most of us do. And especially when you're, when you're trying to share your faith or you're trying to share your testimony. I remember telling a, a young lady on my way to on a plane to uh, Macedonia and telling her about how Christ had changed my life. And she said, oh, no, I don't think so. I think you would have been fine without without Christ. You would have. I'm like, no, you know, and it's kind of like, don't distract me. People try to distract us all the time. And here, both Festus and Agrippa are trying to derail Paul from proclaiming the gospel, from testifying to his to what God has done in him. Festus by calling him insane and Agrippa by saying, you know, ah, right now? You just want me to become a Christian right now? But Paul kept pointing to Jesus. And Paul kept pointing to the message of Jesus. And what is it? Why was he doing that? Romans 1.16 tells us why. That the, pow- the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. The, the gospel is the power of God. Not Paul, not you, not me. It's the gospel message that people come to understand. And that's how God changes and saves people. And he says, I want this so that everyone would become what I am. You know, on the way to wanting everybody to become all that he was, Paul suffered willingly and even patiently. He suffered uh, under trials. He, he suffered under persecution. Uh, he suffered in ways, uh, you know, whether it was on, in shipwrecks or uh, crossing lands. Uh, you, you look up um, 2 Corinthians 11, I think it is, where it, it's all this list of all these things, that all these troubles that Paul had endured. Why? Because he wants to preach the gospel. And he allows others to mistreat him all throughout his life. Again, why? To preach. And every time he's, he has the opportunity to, to present something about his own defense. He doesn't do it. He doesn't talk about himself. He talks about the Lord Jesus and what Christ has done in his life and why he's trying so hard to proclaim this everywhere he goes. There were times he used civil laws and rules to serve the Lord. Again, to serve the Lord, not himself. He was courageous and fearless even in the face of death. At one point in chapter 23, he's talking to the Jewish council, and he says, uh, he says, if I have done anything worthy of death, I'm willing to die. I'm willing to die. But let's, let's get this right. Let's make sure you guys know what you're persecuting me for or why you're bringing me to trial. And even at this point, uh, in the midst of these three chapters, he appeals to Caesar in order to, to go to Rome. He is willing. They're ready to free him, basically. They're saying, oh, this guy really hasn't done anything wrong. And he says, I appeal to Caesar. He wants to go to Rome to preach the gospel. Why? Because he wants, he, as he wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Christ. 
Why follow me? Only because I'm following Christ. Only because I have Christ in me. So Paul's work can be summed up in these three verses, I think. His ultimate task was to proclaim the gospel of God's grace. His inspired calling was to, in, to proclaim that gospel to small and great alike. And his deepest desire was that all may become what I am. So Paul did proclaim the gospel. And quite often he talked about this vision he had. He talks about his testimony. Three or four times he shares his testimony throughout the book of Acts because it's so important. It's so important for people to hear his testimony. And we've been talking about this over the past number of weeks, how important it is for you to be able to share your testimony in very simple ways so that people can hear and understand the change that God has brought about in you. Paul connected with people who didn't believe. He went on these missionary journeys, and in that way, he looked for ways, like at the, at the Oropagus, in at Mars Hill in Acts 17, and how he spoke to those people differently than how he preached to others. But he also proclaimed the whole counsel of God. He spent years in Ephesus. He spent a year and a half in Antioch. He, he, uh, when, even when he was under prison arrest, Governor Felix would send for him, and they would have these talks. And, and it says, the scripture, Luke says, he talked about righteousness and self-control and the judgment. And it kind of wigged out Felix. I mean, sometimes he would just go, 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 just go away. And other times he'd call because he wanted to hear him. Why? Because Paul knew that it's not just about preaching the gospel. It's about teaching to people to obey everything I've commanded you. That's a part of making disciples. We look at his teaching and his writing to his, to the, and all of his letters that he wrote to the church. And we see all the teaching about how to live out your faith in Jesus Christ. This was his ultimate task. His inspired calling, he was willing to preach to anybody and talk to anybody. And you know what? That's the same with us. We need to have that same kind of attitude. Jesus did the same thing. He's just following his Lord. Jesus sends the disciples away and he sits with the woman at the well. Nobody else would talk to her. She, she was a, an outcast, and he wasn't, quote, quote, supposed to talk to her. He hung out with tax collectors and sinners. There wasn't anybody too small. You will never lock eyes with somebody. You will never lock eyes with someone who does not matter to God. Never. Doesn't matter how small or insignificant they are. Doesn't matter how powerful or rich or, or famous they are either. Jesus spoke to them all. Paul did the same thing. He would go to syn small synagogues. He'd be with small groups of men. Uh, he would talk to women. You know, even when there wasn't a place of worship, what'd he do? He goes to the river and he meets Lydia. And Lydia gives her life to Jesus. There was never, think about that, the poor guy that was chained to Paul, you know? I mean, there were times when, people, when someone was actually chained to Paul, and what would Paul do? He would, or the jailer. Paul could have just walked out of the, the prison. Instead, Paul and Silas, they talked to, to the jailer, and his whole household gave their lives to Christ. So Paul's deepest desire is that everyone may become what I am, except for these chains, he says. He's not focused on the chains. He's focused on people becoming like him in his pursuit of Christ. So how do we apply this? Well, one, the first thing is, is our attitude. How do we view people? We need to view people in the same way that, that Paul and Jesus viewed people, that there's no one too great that, that doesn't need the gospel, doesn't need to hear about Christ, and there's no one too small or insignificant. We need to be willing to associate with people of low position. That's what Romans, Paul says in Romans 12. 
and our witness. I mean, if you, if you don't have this lineup of how to share you know, the gospel with somebody, all you have is your testimony, that's good. That's enough. You know, the man healed in John 9 said, you know, I don't know much. He said, I just know one thing. I used to be blind, and now I can see. That's all I know. Well, you know what? That's enough. I mean, that really is enough. You know, my life used to be like this. Then Christ got a hold of me, and now it's like this. It's very different. And then finally, what is your heart's desire? Is your heart's desire for people to know Jesus, does it keep you up at night at times to think about all the people who haven't given their lives to Christ yet? And are you living the kind of life, are you living in such a way that you would want somebody to imitate the life that you're living? If not, look at your life and see what it is that needs to change, what it is you need to move aside, how you need to pursue the Lord and all of his goodness and his strength so that people would see the Christ in you and people would say, Lord, make me like Brad. Lord, make me like Mike. Make me like Josh. Make me like Lisa. Make me like Samantha. You know, help me to be like Kirk Lord Jesus, because then we know actually they want to be like Christ himself, and that's what we want also. Follow me as I follow Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, none of us live perfect lives. We know that. But we want to uh, lay down our sin. We want to lay down the things that hold us back, the, the things that tie us to this world, the things that we tend to hold on to. Help us to, to not just let them go, but throw them away, cast them aside, as, as, Roman, as Hebrews 12 says so that we might pursue you, we might fix our eyes on you, we might desire so deeply to become like your son Jesus, like Paul did, so that people would see the Christ in us. Lord, help us to to take time and develop how we need to uh, share what you've done for us and look for people. Lord, help us to look for people and pray for those opportunities that you give us to share about our lives, to share about what you've done and who you are. Lord, really, we want you to be glorified. That's what Paul wanted, too. In, in, in asking and wanting people to become like him, he just wanted them to become like you. Lord, we trust you, we love you, we thank you, and we give you all the praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.